All you watching online, it's great to be with you again. In these challenging times, we thank God that we can look to him. And since uh, I talked to you last time, now I've become a grandfather for the seventh time. And of course, Melissa's the grandmother. So thank you for all your prayers. And let's look forward to all that God has for us today. Especially in this time of, you know, this global crisis, this pandemic. And one of the uh, messages that God's really put on my heart for this time is uh, a meditation on a very, very popular psalm. And it's called, and it's Psalm 23. Many of us know it as the shepherd's psalm. And sometimes, uh, you know, this psalm has been sung at different occasions, spoken at different occasions, prayed at different occasions. And to many, it's quite a familiar psalm and it can be, so familiar that it becomes unfamiliar and we lose its true meaning and purpose. So let us not only at this time, but take time later to reflect on this psalm because this scripture from the Bible uh, can mean really a lot and can bring forth an aspect of God that can come through in a very living way at this time. So it's Psalm 23. It's uh, a psalm that was written by David, who was a shepherd boy and uh, became a king. And David uh, knew what it was to look after sheep. So he, he was a tender shepherd and he was a true shepherd. We can be a herdsman or a shepherd. And I think the Middle Eastern imagery here of the shepherd and God representing that shepherding image really speaks of someone who's tender, who's a caregiver. And so David in Psalm 23 and verse 1 uh, was going through a great crisis at this time. In fact, uh, some scholars say it could have been at a time when his own son uh, usurped the throne uh, from him and his life was in danger and he had to flee for some time. And when he was in the wilderness taking refuge there, uh, he sung the psalm and he was the author of many of these songs and these psalms that came forth. And it starts like this. It says, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. You see, one more thing about the psalm in the Bible is the positioning of the psalm. Before Psalm 23 came Psalm 22. And Psalm 22 started with the words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it was a, a, a prophetic word. And some call it the psalm of the cross because as Jesus was on the cross, he cried out the very words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As we know, God became man. The Bible describes God as the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. One God, but in a triune personality. And when God came to earth, he became man. He came in the flesh. And as Jesus himself was the incarnation of God who became man. He said that he was the true shepherd willing to lay down his life for the sheep. And the sheep are the fallen ones. The sheep are you and me who have wandered away from God and gone our own way. But in his mercy, God has made a way for us. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And Jesus has made a way through his life so that through his blood, your sin and my sin was taken upon himself. God himself made that sacrifice. He became the way, the truth and the life. And so that we can come to the father through the son. So not only did he lay down his life, but as he predicted, he would die and he would rise up on the third day. And today he is representing us as man's representative in heaven's courts. But when he went, he didn't just leave us alone. But he said, I'm going to the Father. I'm going to send the Son, the Holy... I'm sorry, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity, of the Godhead. And he said, I will send the Holy Spirit. It will lead you and guide you. Now, keeping all this in mind, I want you... To come and journey with me as we continue to look at the psalm. So the Lord is my shepherd. 
That's what David said. And that's what you and I can say as this word resounds in our hearts. And I shall not lack. Verse 2 says, he makes me lie down in green pastures and he leads me beside still waters. But it says, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is not someone of the past. Yes, he's the God of the past. Yes, he's the God of the future. But when Moses asked God, when God appeared to him, he said, what am I going to tell the Israelites about you? Who are you? What am I, how am I going to describe you? And he said, I am that I am. And that means that God is the self-existent one. He's the God who is always present. He's not someone who was. But he's someone who is. Yes, he was, who is, and who is to come. Put it that way. But he's a God above all time. And he says that he will provide for us. When Christ laid down his life, it was not just a philosophical thing. It was for our fallenness. But even that we would know his guidance in this fallen world, even that we would know his provision. He said, you shall not lack. I saw in my own life when I sensed the call of God to just serve him. And at that time, uh, we were called into a full time kind of a capacity in a ministry. And uh, the congregation didn't have even money to support us. And we were challenged by senior leaders to trust God. And such a faith arose in my own heart as a young man with my wife, about 23. I may be older, but I'm still young, young at heart. You see, the Bible says, though the outward man perishes, the inward man is being renewed day by day. And one day we will be with him. This outward shell will wash away, will go away to the ground. But our spirit in the inner man and in our soul and spirit, we will rest before him. So I saw the Lord provide at that time. I saw even things like our needs, sovereignly, how God would provide through various ways without us asking, having to ask anybody else but God himself. And no matter who you are today, a businessman, you're working in a job, a housewife, a family man, whatever is your position, as we look at the uncertainty in this world, as we come to God, who's a God of certainty, we can know his provision. And we can say with the psalmist, we shall not want. And he goes on to say, he makes us lie down in green pastures. You see, it speaks of a rest. God invites us into a rest. Rest at this time, there's turmoil, there's turbulence. But that's the wonderful way that God has invited us into. He doesn't say you will not have trials. He doesn't say you will not have situations. But he says that I will give you rest. In the Hebrew, the word for peace is the word shalom. It speaks of a well-being in God. It speaks of a state of well-being. In fact, it was very interesting in the Old Testament when they went to war, they went to war in the Shalom of God. Today in the world we say you either have war or you have peace. But that really means even in times of trial, in times of test, because God is with us, we can know his shalom. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But he's going to lead us, it says, besides the still waters. You know, I said that Jesus promised the Holy Spirit who said he will lead. He said he will lead and guide you. And the Holy Spirit today is with you and me to lead us and guide us in all truth, in all righteousness. You see, the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your heart and mind. He will not leave you in the wilderness. As you look to him, you'll know his leading. You'll know his guiding. And as you allow him to guide you by his word, by his spirit, by even circumstances that he can open doors and shut doors. Even at times when it seems a hopeless situation. Here is a psalm of hope. We have a God of hope. And he says here, the psalmist says, he restores my soul. You know, we can get weary with life. We can get weary in our situation. 
We are living in a fallen world. We ourselves are fallen human beings. But we've been restored by God and we are being restored. You know, the Bible says when we see him one day, we will be like him. So in one sense, that's the fullness of restoration. But even in our brokenness, even in our sinfulness, God's able to take us and deliver us and work within us and bring us to a place of restoration, of healing, of rest. And he says, he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. You know, in our old strength, we can never get salvation. We can never clean ourselves up. No matter how much good we've done, there's so much bad. And that's where the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, 9 and 10. It says we are saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast. It's not our works that can lead us to eternal life. That's why God himself had to come and pay the price. That doesn't mean we don't do good works. In this pandemic, there's a need for good works. There's a need for us to reach out. There's a need for us to share. There's a need for us to encourage on the phone, to give of our kind. There are people who don't even have a meal. And we probably have stock that we can share with people. We are, we are doing this venture right now where we are asking people to, to sponsor uh, a one-month meal for a family of four. And there's so many other things that we can get joined to. To do good. You see, so the righteousness that we are talking about here is by grace you are saved through faith. Not a works, lest any man should boast. But it goes on to say, you become his workmanship created in Christ to do good works. The Bible talks of when we receive him as Lord and Savior, we get born again. We get a new life in this life. It says in Hindi, Punya Janma Isi Janma Me Ho Sakta. And it's a life of abundance. Not just in kind. See, money can't buy everything. But a fullness, a joy, a strength. Even when we are depleted, we can know his fullness of life. He says, I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. And it's a process of discovery. It's a daily one because the Lord is, right? He is my shepherd even today. Verse 4 goes on to say, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You know, there are valleys that we go through. In this pandemic, in this COVID-19, the shadow of death is really looming. Many times when you're on the street, I've, I've been off sometimes to get some essential goods. And the thought may come to you, whatever I get it. What if I land in hospital? What if I'm not able to breathe? What if I die? But you know the good thing about knowing the shepherd? The one who overcame death. The one who died and on the third day rose again. And he said, today, I hold the keys. He holds the keys. And he has given us a life beyond this life. But even in this life, there will be shadows of death. There comes a time when we come into death-like situations. We just lose hope. We lose a job or lose a business deal or lose this or lose that. Or even lose a loved one. And we say, where are we going? We've hit a wall. We've just hit a wall of blankness. We've hit a, a blank space. But even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And this is important for you are with me. You see, God has promised to stand with us. That word, you are with me, it, it, it gives us a sense of a, a covenant. And the Bible talks of a new covenant that God ordained when Christ came to earth. It's, it was a covenant sealed in blood. And that's why it's, he shed his blood. When you look at every re major religion or philosophy, at one time or the other, they believed in a blood sacrifice historically. Where did that come from in our consciences? There was a thing about the blood sacrifice. It pointed to the true blood sacrifice, the true covenant where Christ himself would shed his blood for the remission of our sins. And he says, when we enter this covenant, all we have to do is believe. All we have to do is receive him. And he becomes a covenant keeper. He stands with us. 
I remember an old song. It's not really old. It's it's quite fresh in my mind. It's kind of, it's a kind of a romantic song sung by Ben E. King, and it says, "Stand by me." And this is the way it goes. It says, "When the night is come, and the land is dark, and the moon is the only light we'll see, no, I won't be afraid. Oh, I won't be afraid. Just as long as you stand by me." And he's singing uh, to his lover here. But when I heard the song, I said, "There's more to this. I'm sure." It's a song that is sung about God Himself. It's a song that is, excuse me, but it's a song that is sung to God. And true enough, as I looked at this uh, the song, and you know, looked at Wikipedia. That's a good way to look sometimes. It went to an old hymn, the originals, where Ben E. King was a churchgoer, and he probably got the song from there. And it went like this, the old hymn went like this. When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. When the world is tossing like a ship upon the sea, thou rulest wind and thou who rulest wind and water, stand by me. In the midst of tribulation, stand by me. In the midst of tribulation, stand by me. When the hosts of hell assail and my strength begins to fail, thou who never lost a battle, stand by me. That could be your prayer today. And as we pray, he answers. You know, God says to us, call unto me and I will answer you. I will show you great and mighty things that you know it's not. He may not always answer the way we want him to answer. But we have the right to ask. In fact, Jesus said, ask in my name. That you may receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will open. It's a kind of continuous present tense in the Greek. Knock and keep knocking. Ask and keep asking. Seek and keep seeking. There's always more to discover. There's always more to explore. There's always more to find. Beloved, he will stand by us. And at this time, not only do we love God and he loves us, but we are called to love one another. We are called to stand by one another. Let's encourage one another. When one is down, pick up the phone, call them up, ask them how they're doing. Say a prayer for them. Give us encouraging scripture like we're doing today. God bless you as you stand with each other. But verse 5 goes on to say, You prepare a table in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. You prepare a table before me in the midst of my enemies. You know, there'll be enemies in life. There'll be enemies in circumstances, enemies that come against us, situations that seem to tear us apart sometimes. Sometimes people like his own family here, David, was betrayed. And sometimes he may have betrayals in our lives. And I remember going through times like that. I remember once when, you know, something was said about me and it went everywhere and it was not true. And it was at a time when I went back to God. And I, and I had this amazing sense of God's presence. I could just describe it like this word. He anointed my head with oil and my cup began to overflow. And there were people around me said, man, are you OK? Because I remember my granddaughter was there and I, she was a little girl at that time. And I picked her in my arms and started to dance. But I heard about this letter mailed against me, which was a false accusation. And someone there asked me, are you OK? Because they thought I should be worried. And it was not my doing. It was not my spirituality. It was the grace of God. And beloved, you and I can know that anointing with oil. In fact, the Bible talks about the priests in the Old Testament who were anointed. And in the new covenant, when Jesus died on the cross, he opened the way for, for us. That whoever believes now can come directly to God. And we can always, all of us be kings and priests to serve God. We can all pray. We can all hear God. We can all sing his praises. We can all do good works. We can be God's light in this new covenant in this world. We can be salt and light. Even in our limitedness, his unlimitedness can be manifested at times. Where you who may have been discouraged or I who was discouraged could become an encourager to someone else. Whatever the task he's called you for in this life, in this limited space or span of time, beloved. 
God will anoint you for that. And the anointing also spoke of an ability that God gave. And he will give you the ability to walk in that call that he has for you. In whichever sphere of life you are, whichever sphere of life you are, remember one thing though. Don't just live for yourselves because that will never bring satisfaction. Yes, the Bible says love your neighbor as yourself. He doesn't say to hate yourself. He says to love yourself, but not yourself where it becomes so self-centered. Because when it becomes self-centered, we get nasty, we get bitter, we lose that shalom, we lose that peace. But when it's God-centered, we can truly thank God for the life he's given to us and love our friends, love our neighbors, even our enemies, we could pray for them. You know, the time will come when God will give you that strength as you ask to even bless those who curse you. There is blessing also in that. So he says, you prepare a table before me and before my enemies and you anoint my head with oil and my cup runs over. In the midst of enemies, there can be provision. In the midst of neg negative circumstances, help can come. And our cup can be full. Remember what I said, Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. The abundant life of God can be your portion. And we can say at the end of this psalm, which we've come to in verse 6, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It doesn't say maybe goodness and mercy. It doesn't say perhaps. It says surely. You know, the covenant that Jesus came to seal with his blood is a sure one. Someone said it like this, goodness and mercy follow us. Even when we push back, or even when we fall back, you fall in the arms of goodness and mercy in the grace of God. The grace speaks of the undeserved favor that God gives us. Not just to know him, but to live this life. When I look at my own life, there are times I'm depleted. There are times, you know, I make mistakes. The Bible says, you know, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But the gift of God is eternal life when we confess our sins to him. And come in honesty and come in openness before God and before man. And not in that nasty pride, but in the spirit of humility. We can surely know goodness and mercy. The mercy of God is always there for us. So let's be merciful to others as well. Because the mercy of God is towards us. Amen. And it says, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Beloved, this life is a temporary life. 2 Corinthians 4 says, whatever you see is temporal. But whatever you don't see is permanent. The life of the spirit is permanent. The life beyond this life is permanent. I remember in my own life, I always I was, I had the fear of death. As a young, young guy, as a 13 and a 14 year old. But I thank God when I met Christ at, at 19 years old and I accepted him into my life. The fear of death left. I had this assurance. In fact, the Bible does talk about that in 1 John chapter 5. It says, I write this to you that you may know you have eternal life. There's a sense of eternity uh, uh, that God gives to us in our own hearts and an assurance. This life is temporary. Don't hold on to these temporal things very tightly. Hold on to the eternal values tightly and to everything else lightly. And you'll find a new sense of joy. An eternal destination. Let's, so let's live life to the fullest. Yes. Let's live in joy. Let's live in peace. But let's live in goodness and mercy. Let's live in sharing life with others. Let's live in sharing the message of hope and peace. In kind, in word, in deed. The Lord bless each one. I'd like to pray for you right now. Father, I thank you for all those watching online or listening online. I pray your blessing on each one, Lord God. I pray that the words of your word that comes from the Bible would become life, Lord. For you truly are our shepherd. We will not lack, Lord. I pray for encouragement emotionally. I pray for where there's instability. I pray for a stableness. I pray for a certainty where there's been uncertainty. I pray for the sense of eternal destination that each one of us would begin to know more and more, Lord God. I pray that each one of us would make a difference in our world, Lord, with the ones and the twos and maybe the multitudes, if some of us are called for that. 
Thank you, Lord. You do anoint our head with oil. And our cup shall run over in this time, Lord God. And surely, Lord God, goodness and mercy will follow us, Lord. Surely we will know that shalom in every situation. Even, Lord, when we're down, Lord God, may we learn to give out of our need. And we know your words coming true. It says, give and it shall be given to you. Pressed down, shaken together, running over. Will men pour into your lap? Thank you, Lord, just for the cycle of giving and the cycle of receiving in you. Bless each one. And I bless you today in the name of Jesus, in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Stay blessed. As they say today, stay safe. But in the shelter of God. In Jesus' name. Amen.